Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Welcome to our discussion on the economic survey for the year 21 and 22. Now before we start the discussion, certain important points. Economic survey is published annually by the government. Generally the practice in the last couple of years has been that two volumes of economic surveys were actually published. But for this particular year, you people are very lucky there is only one volume of economic survey and much more luckier for a very simple reason the two volumes which were published earlier one volume used to have lot of concepts lot of issues being discussed and the second volume used to provide a lot of factual information related to Indian economy in the last one year. So the first volume is actually not provided the second volume is actually what is published by the government. So whatever discussion we will be having will be based on what information has been provided with respect to performance of Indian economy for the year 21 and 22. So with this particular caveat, let us begin the discussion now. First and foremost, let us start with in what situation the economic survey is being published. I am pretty sure all of you know the first point in the situation. Not only Indian economy, even the global economies have been facing or have been passing through the second wave of the pandemic, third wave of the pandemic and so on. And what is the issue here? Issue is that whenever any economy goes through this kind of a situation, there is so much of uncertainty in the economy. For example, let us take Indian economy itself. Imagine there is one more wave of the pandemic. Again, I am saying imagine, right? Let us hope that and pray that it will not again happen. But imagine there is one more wave of the pandemic. Can you tell me with certainty what will be the GDP growth rate during that particular wave? Can you tell me with certainty how much employment will be created? How many jobs will be lost, etc.? There is absolutely no certainty there. So whenever the global economy including the Indian economy go through the pandemic situation like this, there is so much of uncertain, un uncertainty and volatility that is going to be created. That is one point. Second point, there have been lot of supply disruptions which have been caused because of the pandemic. For example, in the last couple of months, you must have read in the newspaper the global freight rates that is a transportation of goods from one market to another market, the global rates for the freight transportation have inched upwards, have moved upwards. Not only this, there is a huge shortage of car, the, the, uh, the containers which are used for the movement of cargo. There is also a shortage of semiconducts, semiconductors which are used in various industries. So there is a huge supply disruption that has been caused because of the pandemic and there are certain repercussions because of this particular disruption which we shall understand in the course of discussion of this particular survey. Third, there is a return of inflation and please understand this, the inflation is not only a problem for Indian economy now, inflation is also a problem for other countries, for example USA. Very recently, I am pretty sure you have come across the article in, articles regarding that in the newspaper has reported one of the highest rate of inflation in the last couple of decades and there are many other countries which are struggling to contain inflation and this particular inflation which is being caused is not just because of the supply side disruption although that is one of the very important problems which is causing inflation, there are also demand side factors which are causing inflation. So it has become a headache for the central bankers around the world including the central bank of India to contain this particular inflation. And the fourth one, in the next couple of months just like what has been happening in some of the countries, you can expect that the central banks will start withdrawing liquidity. For example, have a look at this, the central bank of Brazil. In the last couple of months, that is post March of 2021, has increased the rate more than 8 times or consecutively for 8 times the rate of interest has been increased. And very recently, even the US Federal Reserve has announced that 
it will be announcing or it will be hiking the interest rate come March of this particular year. And whenever this particular rates are hiked, right, there will be volatility in the capital markets or there will be volatility with the capital flows in countries such as India. Now, some of you might be wondering, sir, what is the impact if the US Federal Reserve changes the interest rate, what is going to the impact on India? There is a concept called as a Fed tapering, which we'll discuss later, which has been mentioned in the economic survey also. Done? So, this is the situation when we are trying to ascertain or understand how the Indian economy has actually performed during this particular year of 21 and 22. Now, although I am using the term the year 21 and 22, please remember this particular point. Most of the data that has been quoted in the survey is not for the full financial year. I can understand this. It is not for the full financial year. The 21 and 22 full financial year is, uh, uh, basically means it will start from the 1st of April 2021 and will end on 31st March of 2022. And by the way, I am pretty sure all of you know this. We are still yet to finish the 31st March of 2022. We are yet to finish or cross that particular date. So, the data that has been provided for this particular year essentially is the data from April to December 21-22. Is it okay? That is this particular year for the financial year 21 and 22. Or else in simple terms, it is basically the data from 1st of April 21 till end of December same year 2021. Okay? So, do not get confused with respect to this particular data. So, this is the situation wherein the Indian economic survey has been published and you, and you need to basically understand how the Indian economy has performed in this particular duration. So, let us start. Indian economy has started recovering basically from right the second half of the year 21 that, that is 2020 and 21. Is it okay? After the pandemic, the economy took a right, dive for the first quarter, second quarter, there was a negative GDP growth rate in the financial year 21. And after that, that is basically after the second quarter of the financial year 21, you can see that there is a rising trend right, in terms of the GDP growth rate in case of Indian economy. So, Indian economy has started recovering post the second quarter of the financial year 2021. But please understand this, after the recovery started, there was a second wave of the pandemic. Is it okay? After the recovery started, there was a second wave of the pandemic. And what is the inference that you need to draw from this particular graph here? The graph basically represents the GDP growth rate as well as the GVA growth rate. And you can basically infer that, yes, the second wave of the pandemic again basically had an impact on the recovery rates on the Indian economy. Indian economy was basically recovering there was a second wave of the pandemic, it had an impact on the Indian economy. But if you make a comparison between the first wave as well as the second wave as to what kind of impact they have had on the Indian economy, you can simply summarize by saying that the second wave has had a lower impact on the Indian economy compared to the first wave of the pandemic. Right? That is one inference that you need to remember. Second, what has been the performance of Indian economy in terms of GDP as well as GVA compared to pre-pandemic level? Pre-pandemic essentially means for the year 2019 and 20 and compare that with the GDP as well as the GVA data which has been provided for the year 21 and 22. As per the estimates given by the survey, Indian economy is expected to grow by 9.2 percent for the current financial year. Is it okay? 21 and 22, the Indian economy is expected to grow at a pace of 9.2 percent. That is one point. Second point is, it is basically signaling a very high recovery in the economy. But in addition to this, it is also signaling that Indian economy is performing much better compared to what was the performance of Indian economy before the pandemic. That is, if you basically look at this particular graphical representation here, the GDP value for the year 21 and 22 is higher than the GDP value for the year 19 and 20. 
what is the importance of the comparison? I am basically comparing two years here or the performance of GDP in two years, GDP value of two years and I am trying to ascertain what is the value of GDP uh, right because of the pandemic or through the pandemic and how it has performed compared to let us say the performance of the economy before the pandemic. So, when you compare the pre pandemic growth right or let us say the, the GDP value of these two years, you will realize that the Indian economy's GDP value is higher than what was the GDP value before the pandemic. And this is not just applicable to GDP value, it is also applicable to GVA gross value addition. And when you make a comparison of GVA for the year 19 and 20 with 21 and 22, you will get the same result. That is the GVA of 21 and 22 is higher than the year 19 and 20 which is nothing but a pre-pandemic year which essentially indicates what? What is the importance of this particular graph? You can simply quote this and say that because of this we can say that Indian economy is on a recovery path. It is performing better now. We have gone through the pandemic, the performance of the economy has started improving now. Done? Right? So, these are some of the points related to the performance of Indian economy in terms of GDP and GVA. What about sector wise? how Indian economy is performed in different sectors. Generally, when you look at the data that is published by NSO related to this, they will divide the GDP calculation or they will basically calculate GDP from these particular sectors. That is, there is a agriculture sector, there is a right services sector and also there is a industrial sector. Okay? Now, what has been the performance of all of these particular sectors? First, have a look at agriculture sector one of the very important bright spots in the Indian economy. Even during the pandemic where services sector suffered and manufacturing or industries suffered, it was the agriculture sector which consistently has produced and contributed positively to GDP. Is it okay? I will repeat the statement. Even though during the pandemic we saw that the service sector had an effect or had an impact or even the industrial sector was affected by the pandemic, the agriculture sector was one lone bright spot amongst these three which has contributed positively, grown positively during all of these particular years. And as per the economic survey for the year 21 and 22, it is expected that the agriculture sector will grow by 3.9 percent which is a very good growth rate. Even during the 12th uh, 5 year plan, we wanted to achieve an annual growth rate or uh, average growth rate of 4 percentage in the agriculture sector. But anyways, 3.9 percent is the estimate. What about the industries? What about the industries? The industrial sector actually has contracted by 7 percent in the financial year 21. It has contracted by 7 percent. Now, it has recovered and it is estimated to grow by 11 percent for the current financial year. But within the industries, Right, I can understand this within the industries if you can see this there is one problem area that is a construction sector. The construction sector right had contracted by around 8.6 percent now has uh, recovered but if you basically compare what was the performance of construction sector before the pandemic with the current situation there is only a slight improvement is it okay? There is only a slight improvement in the construction sector. And this sector is very important for a very simple reason. Understand this, when the construction sector starts performing very, very well, it simply indicates two very important things. One, the demand for raw materials or intermediary goods such as cement and steel is increasing. That is natural to happen, right? So, demand for these particular goods is increasing and that is a very good indicator. And second, construction sector is a labor driven sector, labor intensive sector. And when the construction sector starts performing very well, they will create a lot of employment opportunities. That is one point. Okay? So, construction sector, there is a need for further more revival, further more performance from this particular sector. Having said so, there is one more sector here, one more component within the industry, electricity, gas, water supply and other utility services. If you compare what has been the performance of this particular component within industry, it has contributed positively during the pandemic 
and even now that is a pre pandemic and during the pandemic and even for the year 22 it has contributed positively. Now, some of you might be thinking sir why there was no dip or why there was no contraction in this particular segment very simply because during the pandemic also remember this the demand for the utility services was very very high right and that is the precise reason the utility services have performed very well even during the pandemic and the third services sector very very important why more than half of the GDP value actually comes from the services sector itself. I will show you the contribution from different sectors in the next slide, but understand this suffice to remember that more than half of the contribution actually come from the services sector and what has happened in the services sector? The services sector contracted by around 8 and 8 percent I will just round it off contracted by around 8 percent for the year 21 and now has recovered has grown by 8 percent, but please understand if you compare the performance of services sector to pre pandemic level right even today it is yet to recover I can understand this when you compare the performance of the services sector to pre pandemic level the service sector is yet to recover and this is very very important service sector is yet to recover and within the service sector the most important component that is a cause of concern is this one contact driven services sectors is it okay contact driven sectors for example hotel tourism restaurants etc these are generally referred to as contact driven sectors and because of the pandemic first and foremost lockdowns were imposed by the government right various times or multiple times the lockdowns have been imposed in various regions state wise also right the civil aviation market was affected restaurant sector was affected hospitality sector was affected tourism sector as a result of this was affected and because these are contact driven sectors and lockdowns were imposed restrictions were imposed with respect to movement of the people you will see that there is a huge dip in the performance of this particular segment in the year 21 and it has recovered but when you talk about this particular segment of the service sector compared to pre pandemic level it is yet to completely recover and the problem is not just this problem is that even today in certain regions or in certain parts there is still the scale or there is a threat of the covid infection and whenever there is a higher cases the state governments again and again will keep on re imposing lockdowns withdraw the lockdowns again impose lockdowns and withdraw the lockdowns that is the policy of the government they want to contain the pandemic but look at the impact of that on this kind of a segment in the services sector whenever the governments keep on reimposing withdrawing reimposing and withdrawing the lockdowns like this these particular sectors will not be able to gain momentum I can understand this for example sir what do you mean by this imagine in a particular state lockdown was imposed it has been withdrawn by the government now hotels will start thriving they will start performing better tourists will start coming into this particular state again there is a scare of covid again the lockdown is reimposed so the lockdown is reimposed means what tourist right will not come now right so tourism sector gets affected hotel sector or hospitality sector gets affected right so again because of this particular stop and start right very often it will start to perform again there is a break again it will restart again there is a break and that becomes a problem for this kind of a sector is it okay right that is one issue with respect to the performance of the services sector now when you look at what has been the contribution of all of these particular sectors the agriculture sector contributes around 18 percent to the gva gross value addition the industrial sector contributes around 28 percent now focus within the industrial sector the manufacturing sector 15.4 percent 15.4 percent it was 14.7 14.4 and 15.4 percent for the current financial year but if you know various objectives of the government through the policies as such for example make in india objective the government wants to increase the contribution of manufacturing sector to 25 percentage of GDP that is very very far away but nevertheless right just have a look at it 
What about the services sector? Service sector, right, contributes around 53% to GVA. Now, before I go forward, I just want to make one point with respect to agriculture and allied sectors. Now, it is true that even during the pandemic or even today, the agriculture sector is performing, is contributing to the GDP, positive growth rate, that is very important. But that does not mean that agriculture sector was immune, immune to pandemic. I will repeat the statement so that you understand. Yes, it is true that agriculture sector has contributed positively during the pandemic as well as even today to the GDP in India. But that does not mean that agriculture sector was immune to pandemic. Please remember this, even the agriculture sector was affected. There was a survey which was conducted by NABARD. Is it okay? There was a survey which was conducted by NABARD and as per this particular survey, out of the total sample of the villages that were taken, around 54 percentage of the villages right, were found to be affected. That is agriculture sector in these particular 54 percentage of the villages were found to be affected by the pandemic. Sir, how? How pandemic is, pandemic is affecting agriculture sector? The supply chain is getting disrupt, disrupted, the transportation sector is affected right? or overall, overall logistics sector is affected. Do not you think that will make it very difficult for the movement of agriculture commodities or horticulture commodities? I do not you think that will affect the agriculture sector? On the input side, the agriculture sector requires fertilizers, irrigation equipments, machines, etc. And because of the pandemic, lockdowns being imposed, supply chain getting disrupted, even the availability of this was a disrupted. And in many of these particular villages, it was found that the farmers were forced to purchase these inputs by paying higher cost. And in addition to this, even the labor availability became a problem. I can understand this, even the labor availability became a problem. How sir? How agriculture labor became a problem? Very simple reason. At the pandemic, because of this particular pandemic, the labor started migrating. Is it okay? The labor started migrating. Now imagine I am having a farm or a field, I am using certain people or labor. Because of the pandemic, these particular labor have quit and they have moved to their respective places. So availability of a labor also became a problem. Cost of labor increased and as a result of increased cost of inputs, that is fertilizer, right, insecticides, right, higher cost of logistics, higher cost of labor, the overall cost of production in the agriculture sector has increased. So, remember this is the impact of the pandemic on the agriculture sector. I am telling you this for a very simple reason. Most of the newspapers which I am pretty sure you people are reading have stated that agriculture sector has performed right wonderfully has contributed positively to the GDP growth rate, no doubt. But it would be wrong to say that agriculture sector was not affected by the pandemic. That would be a completely wrong statement. Okay. So, these are some of the points with respect to performance of Indian economy. Now, coming to this particular terminology, barbell strategy, okay. barbell strategy, there is one more concept within this, agile approach. These particular two terms have been thrown here and there in the economic survey starting from the first chapter itself. Now, before I start discussing what is provided in the survey, what do you mean by barbell strategy? Right, particular people who go to gym, it is not difficult for them to understand the idea of a barbell. But essentially, the concept of a barbell is that there is a rod like this, and right, what you will do is you will place the weights on both the sides of the rod. Is it okay? Right, it doesn't look like a barbell. Don't worry. Right, so here is a rod, and you will place weights on both the sides of the barbell so that there is a balanced approach here. Now, what is the application of barbell strategy in the economics. Sir, this is related to physical activity and you are discussing economics. What is the correlation? This concept of barbell strategy is very famously used in the financial investments. Is it okay? In the financial sector, very, very famous. Right? What do you mean by the barbell strategy in the economics? Barbell strategy is an approach wherein you want to basically utilize or you want to basically ensure that your 
addressing the risk of investment by balancing that with making certain safe investments. I will repeat the statement. Barbell strategy essentially is an approach wherein you want to balance between the risk as well as the reward in the economy where you are investing or in the market where you are investing. Sir, how can you basically balance risk and reward? Let me give a very simple example. Right? This is the barbell and on one side you will purchase the shares in the market. Is it okay? On one side you will purchase shares and by the virtue of saying that you have invested and purchased the shares, can I simply say that these investments are risky? Is it okay? These investments are risky. Right, sir, give me an example. What if you have invested and purchased the shares of Paytm during the IPO? I can understand. What if you have purchased these particular shares during an IPO? You, the, the IPO is conducted and the market price of IPO, right now, that is a Paytm, have crashed after that. Right, so have a look at this. Essentially, you do not have to write the example of Paytm in the exam. But essentially, what I am trying to say here is, whenever you invest in the share market, there is certain component of a risk. Right? These are risky investments. How can you balance this particular risky investments? You can balance it by investing, let us say, in government securities, such as, uh, let us say, 5 year bonds, or 2 year bonds, or 3 year bonds. So, have a look at this. On one side, when you invest in government securities, these are very, very safe, returns are guaranteed. But on the other hand, you have also taken a very high amount of a risk by investing in the shares. So, idea of a barbell strategy is to basically balance between risk and the returns. Right? You want to balance between the risk return trade off as such. No middle path is actually taken. You will not choose a middle path. You will basically invest in two extreme securities in the market or you will choose two extreme options to invest. On one side, these are very, very safe and on the other side, these are very, very risky. That particular approach is called as a barbell strategy in the financial market. You can apply the same concept for only bonds also. On one side, you can put short term bonds. On the other side, you can put long term bonds. So, that is also called as a barbell itself. So, that is a concept of a barbell strategy used in the financial market. Now, the economic survey says that government of India also used the barbell strategy, but in the Indian economy. What did the government do? The government on one side has basically invested or let us say has basically provided a lot of safety nets to the people. What do you mean by safety nets here? Government of India by spending lot of money has provided certain measures or has implemented certain reforms which will provide relief to the common man. Have you understood? Which will provide the relief to the common man. For example, right, I have given a list here. We will come back to this. Do not worry. Right? There are a lot of reforms which have been implemented which will provide relief to the common man. And on the other hand, the government follows an agile approach. Is it okay? In the one leg, this is one leg. On one leg, the government has basically implemented certain safety nets which will pro protect the common man. And in the other leg, government has followed an agile approach. What is an agile approach here? Government through a continuous loop, continuous loop means there are certain reforms which are being implemented by the government and the government continuously will collect the data and keep on changing these particular policies. Is it okay? I will repeat the statement here. On the other leg or in the other leg, government is going to implement certain strategy or policy which will help the economy to recover. But the beauty of this particular second leg is that government says that we are not going to fix the reforms. Right? That is the approach that we are going to have is not fixed. We are going to change this particular policy approach. We are going to tailor make these particular policies as per the requirement of the economy as against the policy of let us say the waterfall approach which was followed during a 5 year plan. Now, what is the basic difference between a waterfall approach and an agile approach here? In case of water, waterfall approach, imagine you are implementing a policy. Before you implement the policy, everything will be decided. For example, let us say you are implement, implementing a policy. After two years, if there is a problem, what reform has to be implemented? 
what has to be changed that is already decided the course of action is decided you will not change anything i can understand this right on on time to time basis or from let's say year to year basis nothing will change already the program is prepared right as per the program you are going to implement these particular policies right that was basically followed during the period of five year plans but under the concept of agile approach government says that we will collect a certain high frequency indicators is it okay we will collect certain high frequency indicators such as the gst collections such as toll collections on national highway how much movement of the goods is happening how much electricity is being consumed how much payments are being done by using digital payment methods we will collect the data through all of these particular methods and based on what data tells us we will keep on changing the reforms we will keep on adjusting these particular policy measures and that approach right is referred to as an agile approach and look at the importance of agile approach this agile approach basically reduces the importance of budget announcements i can understand this this agile approach basically reduces the importance of budget announcements how sir generally if if you have been following the discussion experts left and right have looked at the announcements in the budget and they are saying whether this particular budget announcements will help indian economy to recover whether they will help growth in the services sector whether they will lead to a virtuous cycle in the economy etc but rather than looking at budget as an event i can understand this rather than looking at budget like an event that is end in itself what if i say that government will add to the policies that they have announced during the budget after let's say couple of weeks government will announce some other reform which will add to higher capital expenditure in the market after couple of months one more announcement is done which will help the recovery in the services sector so what is the government doing here government is essentially telling you that please do not focus only on the budget and decide whether the economy will recover or not the economy can also recover because of these structural reforms that are that i'm going to implement after the budget also and why i'm going to take these particular reforms because i've collected certain high frequency indicator data and the data shows that there is a requirement of a reform there is a requirement of adjustment in one of the policy i will do that right that particular approach is called as an agile approach done remember these particular terminologies can be asked in the upsc can be asked in the upsc not in the prelims maybe in the mains okay now what kind of a safety net reforms have been implemented by the government for example for many women during the pandemic government transferred cash into their bank accounts must have seen many of the women's janthan yojana accounts data has been collected and the cash has been transferred into these particular bank accounts logic was very simple cash transfers will be done it will provide a certain right a basic requirement or it will help it will be used by the women to purchase certain basic necessities from the market okay second pm kisan under this 6000 rupees income support has been provided to the farmers pm gkay that is uh, uh, the uh, garib kalyan anna yojana pradhan mantri garib kalyan anna yojana under nfsa the food grains are being provided at subsidized rates but under garib kalyan anna yojana certain identified beneficiaries were provided food grains at free of a cost free of a cost mind you which will further improve the food security situation in india next onrc reform one nation one ration card reform pm ujjwala yojana under which cylinders or cylinder connections lpg cylinder connections have been provided to households pm garib kalyan rozgar abhiyan where certain states have been identified where reverse migration has happened and these particular people have been provided with certain employment opportunities or wage employment opportunities eclgs emergency credit line guarantee scheme was again announced even in the budget also and in addition to this pm swanidhi scheme under which the government wants to provide loans to 
some of the uh, people who are there in the unorganized sector specifically targeting let's say street vendors so these kinds of reforms have been implemented or measures have been undertaken by the government which will provide a safety net to these particular people and if you look at the reforms the government is not targeting rich people in india government is not even targeting middle household incomes government is essentially targeting the lower tier in the society the low income category households in the economy as such because please understand this pandemic is going to affect all of us no doubt but the impact will be majorly felt by these particular households i can understand pandemic will affect me pandemic will affect you yes no doubt in that but it is the lower income households or poor households which will majorly feel the burden of the pandemic and to provide a certain safety net to these particular households these kind of measures or reforms have been implemented by the government so this is one leg of the barbell what about the other leg what about the other side of the barbell where agile approach is being followed by the government these are some of the reforms that the government has announced and please understand this the survey simply clears the air that the pandemic has affected demand there is no doubt in this is it okay pandemic has affected demand demand in the market has actually come down but i cannot simply implement reforms on the demand side i will also have to implement reforms on the supply side also because over a period of time imagine the pandemic is over right there is no corona threat now the economy that will be there after the pandemic will not be the same as it was before the pandemic i can understand this the economy that we will have after the pandemic will not be the same as the economy we had before the pandemic for example what kind of consumption patterns will be there amongst the buyers what kind of technology will be available in the market right what kind of climate risk now will be we will be facing because of industrialization what kind of a mobility mode of a transportation will be used by the people there will be changes in the economy and these are not normal changes because these particular changes will interact with each other and we do not know what kind of outcome we are going to get because of these interactions once the pandemic is over right so the argument of the survey is that government simply did not implement reforms to increase the demand in the market right the government realized that it is also going to have an impact on the supply side so let's implement reforms even on the supply side so what kind of reforms have been implemented or taken by the government under the supply side one removal of legacy issues such as a retrospective taxation i'm pretty sure you must have read it in the newspaper various companies such as odafone etc now they have agreed that they will withdraw the cases and right these particular cases or the issues would be settled so some of you might be thinking sir what is the impact of this very simple it will give more clarity for the foreign investors in india i can say it will give more clarity now the foreign investors will be looking at this and they'll feel that okay government will also take our interest into consideration in terms of making policies so this is a right step or it is a step in the right direction taken by the government and in addition to this this will also promote ease of doing business in india because the companies want to conduct a business provide goods and services and definitely as at the end of the day generate profits they do not want to be involved in a tug of war with the government it is a lose lose situation for both of them okay so one removal of legacy issues such as a retrospective taxation government is promoting privatization best example the disinvestment of air india now right the disinvestment policy under which government of india has divided the sectors into strategic as well as non strategic production linked incentives pli next reforms in dicgc right whenever they will be discussed in under or they will be discussed under respective modules or chapters i will tell you certain points related to this expansion of factoring ecosystem we are promoting more and more participation of nbfcs in the factoring business now revise the definition of msms right earlier we are focused only on the investment done by these particular msms now we have revised this particular definition to include the investment as well as the turnover of these particular msms 
and because the limits have been increased the MSMEs will continue to get the benefits from the government and they will continue to enjoy right the accreditation or recognition of MSMEs. New disinvestment policy and the national monetization pipeline NMP under which government wants to monetize a large number of infrastructure projects and generate huge amount of money which can be invested in other infrastructure projects. So, these are some of the very important supply side reforms which have been announced, implemented or in the process of being implemented by the government. But with respect to these particular reforms, right, there are two very important points that you need to remember. First one, these particular reforms, the objective is to improve the flexibility and innovation in order to deal with the long term unpredictability of the post COVID world. If you remember 5 minutes ago, I told you this, post COVID, how the economy will be there, we do not know. What kind of a consumption patterns we will have, we do not know. Because definitely as the COVID has affected what kind of a goods and service we actually consume. Done? Right. So, post COVID, in the long term, we want to provide certain flexibility to the economy, right, which will help in coping with right whatever the challenges that the economy will face post the covid for example have a look at this the factor market reforms what do you mean by factor market reforms in case of the microeconomics i am pretty sure you must have read about the four factors of production one of the very important factors i'll focus on that here one of the very important factors of production is labor and government of india is in the process of implementing four labor codes Right, so, this is one very important example of government of India implementing a reform to help Indian economy get this particular flexibility to basically address any challenges post COVID. Second, trade finance factoring, right, earlier I have already told you NBS is promotion or participation of NBS is being promoted in the factoring business now. Reforms in the telecommunication sector, right, very, very important. So many reforms have been announced by the government to address the issues in the telecom sector. Removal of legacy issues such as retrospective taxation and privatization and monetization of the assets. And on the other hand, these particular reforms are also aiming or the objective of these particular reforms is also to improve the resilience of the Indian economy in the short term. In the short term, we want to improve the resilience. Resilience means in the short term, how Indian economy will basically cope up with the impact that the pandemic has on the economy. For example, government has provided support to a lot of industries under the concept of Atmanirbhar Bharat packages. Atmanirbhar Bharat 1 package or package 1 was announced, 2 was announced, or 3 was announced. So, a lot of these particular initiatives have been announced by the government to provide support to these industries or these particular sectors. For example, package right has been announced for msme sector right various industries or various sectors which are suffering right there is a, a support package for them also right so various announcements have been done by the government to provide support to these particular industries social infrastructure is being targeted now for example last year right a huge amount of expenditure has been done for developing healthcare infrastructure right huge amount of expenditure has been done for development of let us say rural infrastructure such as housing under the initiative of Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, right. So, social infrastructure is also being promoted. And the third one, now the government in the especially in the last couple of years has been focused on entering more and more free trade agreements, but more importantly government now says that we want the free trade agreements which are reciprocal in nature. What do you mean by reciprocal in nature? Very simple. Government says I want to enter into those particular free trade agreements where even I will get the benefit from the agreement. Because earlier also we have entered into free trade agreement with South Korea, Japan, right, ASEAN, etc. But what has happened with respect to these agreements is that the other countries who are the partners in the agreement, they have benefited more compared to India. They have got more benefits compared to India. Right? So, we want to enter into those agreements now and also review other agreements wherein right there is a reciprocity right, or reciprocal benefit that is earned by the Indian economy also right. So, these are some of the very important points related to the reforms which have been announced under the supply side reforms by the government. Now, in the 
economic survey what are the important areas that have been covered fiscal developments have been covered we will discuss those particular points do not worry monetary management prices and inflation external sector agriculture industry services skill development and employment and uh, the infrastructure right as well as investment so these are some of the very important areas which have been covered let us discuss one by one let us start what about fiscal development I have given a very nice picture here pie chart five pie charts have been provided sir should I mug up the pie chart do not waste your time what is the inference what information you need to derive focus only on that if you basically look at the pie chart right move from the left to right like this if you basically look at this particular pie chart what you will observe is how government of India spent money in the last two years is it okay how government of India has incurred expenditure in the last two years that is basically during pandemic initially government of India started providing support for the population which would be affected by the pandemic for example Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana was launched right the concept of uh, uh, cash transfers was introduced uh, right for women destitutes uh, etc right so free food grains were given right these were some of the reforms that were announced to provide safety net for the poor people and that is the precise reason you will see that during this particular period more than 80 percentage of the expenditure that was incurred by the government was on providing food as well as livelihood for the people but gradually if you keep on moving follow the arrow mark that I have drawn here you will realize that there is a change right in the expenditure pattern of the government from the first pie chart to the last pie chart what you will observe is in the last pie chart the investment expenditure has increased I have understand this investment expenditure is very very high I do not look at only the percentages and come to the conclusion please look at the percentage out of how much expenditure I can understand this do not look at only the percentages and be fooled by all of these particular numbers look at the percentages out of how much is the total expenditure for example in the march 2020 the expenditure incurred by the government i'll round it off 2 lakh crore rupees right and in the month of october how much is the expenditure 73000 crores and june to december current finance sorry 2021 how much is the expenditure around 7 lakh crore rupees so when you look at right 17 percentage of let us say 7 lakh crore rupees that will be a very very high number around 1.2 lakh crore rupees. So over a period of time what government of India has done is basically has followed this with the pandemic initially government focused on providing relief, providing livelihood, providing free food grains, providing safety net to the people who would be affected by the pandemic and once that has been taken care of government has started focusing on the infrastructure development right focus on investment why please understand this there is always this particular concept of a multiplier effect even in the budgetary discussion or budget discussions have done this there is always a concept of a multiplier effect multiplier effect is associated or it simply means that with one rupee increase in the government expenditure the overall productivity in the economy will increase by how much I can understand this with one rupee increase right in the expenditure done by the government the overall production in the economy will increase by how much that is essentially the idea of multiplier effect and as per the survey that has been conducted by NIPFP there is a huge multiplier effect associated with capital expenditure and that is the precise reason again and again or over and over government of India emphasizes on the capital expenditure or in short capex let me give you a simple example in the recently published budget or announced budget government of India has announced a capex of 7.5 lakh crore rupees 7.5 lakh crore rupees very very high and especially if you compare it to let us say last year how much was the budgeted expenditure 5.5 lakh crore rupees so almost 34 to 35 percent increase compared to the budgetary estimates of last financial year or current financial year for that matter right so government wants to invest more government wants to spend more and have a multiplier effect and what there is one more point important related to this 
whenever government increases the investment in the market like this, there is a crowding in of the private investment. I will repeat the statement. Whenever the government increases the investment, private sector will start feeling comfortable. The confidence on the economy will start improving, right? Because the government is investing, right? So, when government starts investing like this, the private sector will start crowding in. They will also start investing in the economy. And do not we want the private sector also to invest? Definitely, yes. So, just continuing this particular idea itself, have a look at this. The government has increased the capex by 34 and half percent in the budget for the year financial year 22. Do not say, sir, you have already told this. For financial year 22, it was increased by 34 and half percent compared to the financial year 21. Right? Is it okay? And from financial year 22 to financial year 23, Again, right around 34 to 35 percent increase has been provided by the government. Second, capex that is a capital expenditure was focused on infrastructure development such as roads, railways, ports, power, etc. Third, government in addition to all of this also has announced national infrastructure pipeline. When the NIP was actually announced, government targeted around 6800 plus projects right of infrastructure to be developed under NIP. But over a period of time more and more infrastructure projects have got added right to this particular NIP and now a huge number of infrastructure projects are planned under national infrastructure pipeline. And next one has announced various important reforms such as PLI production linked incentive. Initially we targeted only 3 sectors, it was increased to 13 sectors. And that is what has been given in the economic survey initially, but later in some of the pages they have said that now 14 sectors are covered. Initially we started with 3, expanded to 13, now 14 sectors are covered. Now those of you who are listening so easily or so patiently to this particular lecture, here is a task for you, a very simple task. Please find out which is the 14th sector which is covered under PLI. I know, I have got to understand this, I know that, do not say sir, sir you do not know, right, so you are giving homework to us, absolutely nothing of that sort, I know which is the 14th sector, but I want you to do some research, give your, right, thumbs or let us say the fingers also some work, right, and find out which is the 14th sector and there is a probability that this could be asked in the UPSC prelims and that is the reason why I am asking you, you to find it out. So, PLI also has been announced by the government which will promote investment, which will promote production, which will promote sales of the companies, which will also promote employment generation and reduce the import dependence, right. So, PLI scheme also has been announced by the government. Now, what are the fiscal numbers? What are the financial numbers? Now, please understand this, I will not be discussing fiscal deficit, revenue deficit here, why? Economic survey has given the data related to FD, RD, etc., but that is applicable for the year 21 and 22, which is useless now. Is it okay? Which is useless, do not worry. If at all the question is asked in UPSC, he might simply ask you what is announced in the budget. Is it okay? And already in the budget discussions, we have covered, right, what has been the fiscal deficit target right for the next financial year, what has been revised for the current financial year, etc. we have already discussed. Apart from this, right, there is a concept of public debt, right, there is a concept of public debt. Now, essentially the idea of public debt is the amount of a borrowings done by the government. Is it okay? The amount of borrowings done by the government and the government will borrow from the domestic market and will also borrow from the foreign market. I am using the term foreign market, they will simply replace this with external market, is it okay? Right, so domestic mar market borrowing is there and external market borrowing is also there. What is important point here? Out of the total borrowings done by the government, more than 90 to 95 percent in fact, okay, around 95 percent, around 95 percent of the borrowings are domestic in nature, is it okay? Around 95 percentage of the borrowings again I am rounding off, right, are domestic in nature, remaining are foreign in nature. And what is the importance of this? Importance is that whenever your borrowings are there from the external market, 
you will have to repay in a foreign currency and when you need to repay in foreign currency you as a borrower might face exchange rate risk is it okay you might simply face exchange rate risk meaning what sir imagine you have borrowed only one dollar simplify imagine you have only borrowed one dollar when you borrowed it one dollar was equal to let us say 50 rupees which essentially means you have borrowed 50 rupees and today you are supposed to repay that one dollar but today the exchange rate is one dollar is equal to 60 rupees which means now you will have to pay 60 to get this one dollar and you will have to repay this one dollar which means what you are repaying more money I am not even calculating interest here which simply means you are repaying more money than you have borrowed right so whenever your borrowings are more external in nature you might face an exchange rate risk right but in case of India majority of the borrowings are domestic in nature you can have a look at the data please do not mug up this particular absolute numbers do not mug up this second important point right have a look at this second important point with respect to the fiscal development is that the uh, the borrowings right or the debt of the central government compared to the GDP is it okay the debt of the government compared to GDP or else they will simply use a term debt to GDP ratio okay debt to GDP ratio was almost stagnant or let us say was almost in the same uh, let us say the level starting right from 2010 and 11 is it okay post 2010 and 11 again or some of you might simply say sir 11 and 12 is a better indicator so let us take 11 and 12 so starting 11 and 12 the debt to GDP ratio was almost stagnant it was moving I am not saying it was not moving it was almost stagnant right later what you can see is around 16 17 right post that right or after that there has been a decline again there is a stagnant GDP tax to, sorry uh, the debt to GDP ratio but after that there has been a sudden spike in the debt to GDP ratio remember this right the public debt of the government has actually spiked in the last couple of years now what is the importance sir UPC will ask you trend based questions is it okay UPC generally will ask you trend based questions what do you mean by trend based questions he will throw a statement such as fiscal deficit as a percentage of GDP has consistently increased the public debt or the central government debt to GDP ratio has consistently declined in the last five years in the last seven years these are called as a trend based questions so have a look at the trend here neither it has remained stable for last one decade nor it has consistently increased for last one decade nor it has consistently declined in the last one decade right all the three statements will be wrong here right almost stable for many years there is a small dip stable again there is a sudden hike now some of you might be thinking sir why there is a sudden hike right just think just apply the common sense you will understand in the last couple of years because of the pandemic the expenditure that is incurred by the government has a skyrocketed has increased and when the expenditure increases right obviously the borrowings of the government will increase and when the borrowings of the government increases what do you think will happen to the the debt to GDP ratio it would have also increased and that is the reason you will see a spike like this having said so it is also estimated that in the coming days this particular debt to GDP ratio again will start declining and you need to reduce it have you understand government needs to reduce it why please understand this as per NK Singh committee is it okay as per NK Singh committee right that was set up to review FRBM in India the total debt to GDP ratio for both center plus state is supposed to be around 60 percentage of GDP remember this number is supposed to be around 60 percentage of GDP out of this 60 percent 40 percentage of GDP will be the debt given to the center right that will be the total debt of the center and remaining 20 percentage of GDP is given to the state but I will show the, the later slides what has happened to even the debt to GDP ratio of the states that also has increased. So, if you want to meet the targets which are given under the NK Singh committee you will have to reduce this particular debt and moreover even if there are no targets always remember this you need to have lower debt I can understand you need to have a lower debt which simply means borrowings should be lesser 
right as a percentage of gdp because over a period of time these are liabilities these are the repayments that you have to do if you do not control them right it may simply balloon and go beyond a manageable level right so you do not want to reach that situation you want to keep it under control reduce the debt then these are related to the debt uh, 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 debt comparison to the gdp but apart from this there is one more very important concept related to the uh, public debt that is i said that government borrows right government in the domestic market will borrow by issuing g securities is it okay right the treasury bills dated securities etc now always remember this government prefers to borrow for longer duration rather than borrowing for shorter duration is it okay government always prefers to borrow for a longer duration compared to shorter duration why sir right don't you think borrowing for shorter duration would be a much better situation because you will borrow and you will repay right no burden for you no not necessarily understand the logic here take the finances of the government today do you think the finances of the government are very good or finances of the government are under lot of stress you should say sir second one they are under lot of stress so in that particular situation imagine you will borrow and you will have to repay within let's say next to 91 days can you imagine the pressure that the economy will feel and yes you can repay it right you can repay it but imagine out of the money that you wanted to spend this year you will take some of the money and you will repay the short term debt that simply means now this money will not be available for spending on health care this money will not be available for spending on infrastructure etc that is the precise reason the governments generally prefer to borrow in the form of a bonds or in the form of government securities having very long durations and what has been the situation in case of india majority of the borrowings that are done by the government have longer tenures have longer maturity periods and that is exactly what has been provided in this particular bar graph that is if you compare right between 2012 and 13 and 2020 to 21 right financial year 21 with financial year 13 what you will see is the number of bonds or the the total value of the bonds which have been issued by the government which have larger maturity or a longer tenure have increased between these two years for example those particular bonds out of the total bonds issued which have a maturity period of 20 years and above consist of 19 percentage of the bonds which are issued by the government in financial year 21 whereas they were only around 11 percent back in the year financial year 13 and this will help the government why please understand this there are two risk which are involved related to these kind of bonds remember the terms here one is called as a roll over risk one is referred to as roll over risk and the second one is called as a interest risk right what do you mean by this let's start with the first one interest risk imagine government of india has borrowed today and it is providing interest rate of 3% okay it has announced a interest rate of 3 percentage on this now government right will repay the amount pay the interest also right let's say after 2 years again they are borrowing from the market now the interest rate is 4% which essentially means now government has to pay more interest rather than doing this have a look at this rather than doing this what if government of india had adopted this strategy imagine this was the tenure of 2 years and this was the tenure of 5 years right so have a look at this this year they have issued right this bond interest rate 3% rather than issuing for a tenure of 2 years what if government of india had issued the same bond with the tenure of let's say 10 years is it okay let's say a tenure of 10 years in that case government would have simply provided let's say 3% or 3.2% rate of interest which would have reduced the cost of borrowing for the government when after 2 years they would have borrowed again the money but at 4% because from one year to next year interest rates will vary remember that right so if you borrow for longer duration when you are announcing coupon rate is fixed so you do not have to be worried whatever the interest rate is there in the market you will not change the interest rate on the or let's say coupon rate on the issued bonds i can understand right so one issue is interest rate risk that will be addressed if you have a long term bond and second one is a roll over risk what do you mean by roll over risk 
generally what government does is have a look at this imagine a bond has been issued now okay right understand the differences here don't get confused imagine a bond has been issued worth 100 rupees and the duration is 2 years and let's say hypothetically right the interest rate or the coupon rate at which this bond was issued was 2% now government after 2 years will have to repay the principal so rather than paying out of its own money out of let's say the uh, con uh, consolidated fund what the government does is they will issue one more bond after 2 years collect 100 rupees and use it to repay this particular 100 rupees but the problem here is and this is called as a rollover I can understand this this is called as a rollover and the problem here is this 100 rupee bond which is issued by the government now government might offer 3 percent rate of interest or the coupon rate which essentially means higher rate of interest now higher payment so whenever government issues bonds with a longer tenure or longer maturity rollover risk is minimized interest rate risk is minimized and that is what you are seeing in this particular graph next right what about the states what about the physical indicators or financial indicators for the states have a look at the debt to GDP ratio have a look at the debt to GDP ratio and again no surprises here the debt to GDP ratio is higher right it has crossed more than 30 percent it has crossed more than 30 percent that is one point you need to remember second very important point fiscal deficit fiscal deficit of the states for the year 2021 it was 4.6 for the year 21-22 it is 3.7 percent right what has happened do not say that sir fiscal deficit has come down by a large margin that is not the appropriate answer here the argument here is government that is a central government during the announcement of the budget will also announce what is the fiscal deficit target that it is allocating for the states for example the recently announced budget for the state governments fiscal deficit target is 4 percentage of their gross state domestic product and in the same way for 2021 is it okay for 2021 the target that was given by the central government was 5 percent and for 21 22 the target that was given by the government for the states was 4 percent right so that is the reason for 2021 the fiscal deficit is 4.6 and for 21 22 3.7 percent right now having looked at the states financials central government financials i will come back to this what is the general right uh, situation of the financials in the economy right have a look at this the overall debt to gdp ratio right general they will simply use the term general or overall right and whenever they use the term general and or let us say or overall it simply means a center plus states right so general or overall debt to gdp ratio has a balloon right to 89.3 percent again having said so you do not know at the end of financially it will be how much but it is definitely more than 89 percent now second right the fiscal deficit is it okay the fiscal deficit right had ballooned to more than 13 percent now it has been brought down to right around 10 percent and what has been right the basic uh, revenue deficit revenue deficit had ballooned to more than 9 percent now for the current financial year it is estimated to be around 5.6 percent right now in addition to this what supporting measures have been announced by the government for the state governments one the borrowing limits for the states have been increased just now we have discussed this for financial year 21 it was 5 percentage of gross state domestic product for financial year 22 it was 4 percent and for financial year 23 budget announcement again 4 percent loans to the states in lieu of a gst compensation shortfall during the pandemic it was found that there is a huge amount of a gst revenue shortfall and to address this particular gst revenue shortfall a new window or a new uh, let us say a reform was announced right or new measure was announced by the government wherein the central government would borrow right more than 1 lakh crore rupees from the market give it to the states to basically satisfy this particular gst compensation right that particular window is open now right the central government is actually front loading giving the money to the states and the third one the state I'm sorry central government also has announced special assistance to states capex 
for the development of capital expenditure, for the development of infrastructure, central government in the financial year 2021 has actually announced this particular scheme, wherein initially right for the year 2021, 20, uh, the government announced 11,830 crore rupees for the states, which will be a loan given without any interest being charged on the state and the duration of the loans will be 50 years. Right, it should be ringing a bell because this same concept has been announced even in the budget. But look at the number now. For the financial year 21, 11,830 crores. For the financial year 22, it was 10,000 crores. But for financial year 23, government of India has announced 1 lakh crore rupees. Same, without any interest, 50 year duration loans to the state governments. So, these are some of the supporting measures that the center has taken in order to promote right, more investment, more borrowing to be done by the state governments. Done. In addition to this, there was one interesting fact given in this particular survey that is related to GST revenue collections. This could be asked in the prelims, just make a note of this. As per the survey analysis, how much GST revenue is collected per month? Is it okay? As per the analysis done by the survey, Per month, how much GST revenue has been collected? From 2017, it has been increasing. In 2017, right? because 1st July 2017, we have implemented GST. So, from 2017, in the year 2017-18, on monthly basis, we collected 0.9 lakh crore worth of GST. And, right, 21-22 up to December, Right, per month, the GST revenue collection is 1.1 lakh crore rupees, which is definitely a positive indicator for goods and services tax. This could be asked in the UPSC prelims. Please remember this. Even if it is not asked in the prelims, if there is any question on, let us say, GST evaluation, you can quote this particular point there. Done? These are some of the points related to fiscal indicators. Let me go to the next one. External sectors. What has happened to exports? For the financial year 22, government of India has targeted exports worth 400 billion dollars. Worth 400 billion dollars. And already till December, we have been able to export more than 300 billion dollars. 75 percent of the targets is already achieved. Right? What are the reasons why we have been able to achieve this much amount of exports? Because in the earlier year, our exports were affected, imports were also affected because of the pandemic. The reasons are, one, the global market is recovering now. Second, the consumer demand, right, in the global market or in the other countries, there was a pent up demand that is also increasing. The governments around the world have provided certain supportive measures to the households. Money has been given to the households. Now, they are using this particular money to consume goods and services in the market. We are able to export more. Third, pent up savings. And the fourth one, government of India through various initiatives is also promoting more and more exports from India. For example, government of India has implemented RODTP scheme. Before that, there was a MEIS scheme. There is a SEIS scheme, EPCG scheme, etc. So many schemes. In addition to this, there are export promotion councils such as APEDA, who are also taking initiative and they are promoting more and more exports from India. And these are the reasons why exports after slumping, after coming down in the last two years have started recovering. And that is definitely a good news for the Indian economy. Now, where all we have sent these particular exports? Who are the countries who are importing from India? The top five countries are USA, UAE, China, Bangladesh, Hong Kong. These are the top five countries. But the survey makes a one point, right? Remember this. This particular country, Belgium, is a new entrant in the top 10 exporting destinations for India. Last year, Belgium was not there in this list, right? In fact, Myanmar was one of the countries. So, Belgium has entered into the top 10 exporting destinations for us and Myanmar has been pushed back. Right. So, remember this particular special fact or the fact which has been mentioned in the survey nonetheless. Done. But having said so, understand the problem. The survey notes that although in the last 20 to 25 years, we have exported more and more goods and services. I am talking only on the merchandise now here. 
we have diversified how many types of goods we are exporting to how many countries we are exporting we have diversified expanded the list but nevertheless what you can see is 40 percentage of the exports which are done by india merchandise exports mind you 40 percentage of the exports which are done by india are going to the top seven countries out of top 10 seven countries are actually receiving or importing more than 40 percentage of the exports which are done by india which essentially means there is further more potential for us we can further diversify the the type of exports that we are doing and we can further diversify the number of countries to which we are exporting so there is a need to implement or take measures regarding this next with regards to imports again during a pandemic imports came down but now imports have recovered is it okay during pandemic imports were actually affected imports came down but now the imports have recovered now imports into india actually have increased and that is a precise reason understand this during pandemic in some of the months india enjoyed a current account surplus is it okay during pandemic in some of the months india in fact enjoyed a current account surplus but now what has happened right we have returned back to the basic idea of a current account deficit which i'll show you in a minute so these are some of the importing countries the top five importing countries china uae usa saudi and iraq these are the top five right uh, basically the countries which are exporting the goods to india this is related to imports and exports now have a look at the trade balance what you can see is during the pandemic okay during the pandemic right the exports right came down exports crashed and the imports also crashed right and if you basically see this right despite crashing i can understand this despite crashing the exports were higher than the imports and as a result of this in some of the months like i said earlier we had a current account surplus but now what has happened the exports have recovered imports also have recovered as a result of this as a result of this we have returned back to the concept of or we have returned back to a situation wherein there is a current account deficit now should you be worried about current account deficit definitely yes please remember this you should also con be concerned about current account deficit do not simply say that okay sir CAD is there right we will manage it no why a CAD should be a concern because please understand this as per various surveys which have been done a CAD of up to 2 to 2 and half percent again it might vary right but generally it will be, it will be somewhere around 2 to 3 percent okay a CAD of this particular range is manageable for us is it okay it is manageable manageable for us anything beyond this becomes a problem why whenever you say current account deficit it simply means that you are paying more money to rest of the world compared to what you are actually receiving in the form of let's say income in the form of uh, let's say goods and services that you have imported you are paying more that is the reason there is a current account deficit and generally whenever there is a current account deficit in india what we do is there is a surplus in the capital account is it okay there is a surplus in the capital account which we will use to basically bridge the deficit in the current account sir what do you mean by this under the capital account imagine there is a surplus inflow of 80 billion dollars just imagination okay whereas in the current account there is a deficit of 10 billion dollars which essentially means to rest of the world i will have to pay this particular 10 billion dollars from where will i get it i cannot print dollars in india i do not say sir right printing machines are there by uh, which are owned by the government let us print dollars not allowed so from where will i get it i will basically take these particular 80 billion dollars out of this 10 billion dollars i will bridge the current account deficit but that is a problem why that is a problem the capital account is generally associated with investment i can understand this capital account is associated with investment fdi for example we are supposed to receive lot of investment into india invest and promote growth but out of this particular 80 billion dollar if 10 billion dollar actually goes like this don't you think that's a problem it simply means we are not receiving more dollars to invest in india that is the reason right there is a manageable current account deficit and beyond this it becomes a headache for the government okay 
Now, what are the reforms which have been implemented by the government to promote exports? Remission of duties and exports, right? Um, re remission of duties and tariffs on export products. That is one scheme which has been implemented for more than year, one year now. Production linked incentive scheme has been implemented. EPCG, export promotion of capital goods. Under this, the export obligation has been reduced from 90 percent to 75 percent. Right and right, there is a scheme by Ministry of Commerce by the name districts as export hub wherein we will identify these particular districts one by one and whichever product has an export potential we will promote that exports. Now some of you might be thinking sir wait there is something else that is ringing a bell in my head. There is a similar scheme by the name one district to one product ODOP. There is a similar scheme by the name one district one product. Are you explaining that? No. ODOP was a different scheme. District as export hub was a different scheme. But what has happened is the government has basically taken the ODOP scheme, merged it for operational implementation, merged it under district as export hub scheme. Okay? These are the reforms. What has been with respect to the services exports? Right, imports and exports of services have recovered and have a look at this. As a result of the recovery in the service exports, India has been able to perform much better in case of services sector compared to other countries and even compared to what was the performance of the services exports and imports pre-pandemic level. Now, some of you will basically say, sir, pre-pandemic level will be 19 and 20, right, and this will be, right, 21 and 22. But you are saying it is performing better than the pre-pandemic level. But as far as I can see, the value of service exports of our 21-22 is lower than the pre-pandemic level. You are correct. On paper, it looks lower. But please understand the concept here. This data only represents from April to December. As already mentioned, it is for April to December. And this is for the full financial year. So when you take the same time period, the survey says that, the service exports and imports have started performing much better compared to the pre-pandemic level. And out of these particular imports, there is a one import that is the remittances. India, right, remember this, India post 2018 has been the largest country or the top country in terms of inward remittances. Is it okay? In terms of inward remittances, for example, the most important component of remittances is the salaries which are earned by the Indian citizens abroad and which are sent back to India. So, India has remained the top country or let us say the first country in terms of accepting inward remittances from 2018 and for 21 it will continue to remain same. Is it okay? For 21 it will continue to top this particular table, right? And as per this particular table which is given by the survey, right, we are going to receive 87 billion dollars in terms of inward remittances. Done? What about the balance of payment situation in India? There was a current account surplus in the first half of financial 21 and now it has become a current account deficit of 0.2 percentage of GDP for the first half of financial 22. You do not have to mug up the data. Remember, right? for some time there was a surplus, now it has a flipped back to deficit. Second, however, there was an overall balance of payments surplus right, of 63 billion dollars. How is that possible? Already I have told you, current account deficit, but surplus in the capital account and overall there is a BOP surplus, right? And as a result of this particular BOP surplus, even the foreign exchange reserves have crossed a landmark level of more than 600 billion and, right, remember this, they have reached more than 630 billion now. Do not need to mug up this data because by the time you write the exam, this particular data would have already changed. But what is the importance of the forex reserves? Have a look at this. There is a term called as import cover. Okay, there is a term called as import cover. What is this import cover? Imagine you have forex reserves worth 100 billion dollars and you are importing let us say 10 billion dollars on monthly basis. So, using this particular 100 billion dollars for how many months you can import the goods? In this particular example, it will become 10 months. Is it okay? It will become 10 months. Now, have a look at this. However, the import cover has actually declined from 17.4 months 
by the end of March 21 to 13.2 months by the end of December 21. Some of you might be thinking, sir, you are contradicting yourself. You say that the forex results have increased, but now you are saying that import cover has declined. How is that possible? You are wrong. No, I am not wrong, right? I have taken this data from economic survey. A reason for this is, you are assuming these are forex results, right? And this is the value of imports. What if the value of imports increases? I do not you think the import cover will also get affected. Let me give a very simple example. Imagine, right, the forex reserves will increase from 100 to 120 billion dollars. Imagine the forex reserve increased from 100 to 120. If the import value remains the same at 100 billion dollar, then the import cover will be for, for 12 months. But what if I say the import value has increased to 15 billion dollar per month now? Despite a rise in the forex reserve, import cover will actually come down to 8 months. That is exactly what has happened here. Okay? At the end of November 2021, India was the fourth largest foreign exchange reserves. Right? The top three countries are China, Japan and Switzerland. India is the fourth largest country in terms of holding forex reserves. Done? Now, overall, right, the moment of a balance of payment as well as forex reserves, right, the, uh, the data is given here. You do not have to mug up anything, right. What you can see is, uh, right, the capital account, current account, right, the surplus uh, deficit has uh, actually moved like this, right. But capital account has always remained, uh, right, a surplus. But current account, right, there was surplus in some of the months, but now we have returned to a deficit situation. Done, right. And this basically shows uh, the moment of forex reserves in India. And uh, we have crossed already the threshold of more than so 600 billion dollars, and now they are more than four. I'm sorry, they are more than 630 billion dollars. Okay, and this particular data basically shows uh, what is the standing of India in terms of external debt, right? What is the external debt for India? Now, why this is important? Very simple. Generally, when the external debt starts increasing, it will put pressure on the economy. Because you are borrowing more and more from the foreign market, you will have to pay more and more in the foreign currencies. That is, right, a pressure situation for the economy. What has happened with respect to external debt for Indian economy? First and foremost, look at the September 21 data. The overall external debt for the Indian economy has reached 593 billion dollars. Okay, 593 billion dollars. Out of this particular 593 billion dollars, more than 51 percentage of this particular debt is actually in the form of dollars itself. Sir, what do you mean by this? We would borrow in different currencies, but in terms of reporting the debt, we will convert all of these particular borrowings in terms of dollars. Right? So, as a result of this, the borrowing now is 593 billion dollars. But because of uh, right, the dollars borrowing or because of the borrowings that we have done only in the form of uh, the dollars, right, that is a 51 percentage of the total borrowing done. And uh, another point of uh, uh, importance here is compared to December 19, right, by September, 20, uh, September 21 here, right, the borrowings that is external borrowings of Indian economy have started increasing or they have increased. And understand this. Although higher borrowings is a problem, in this situation, whenever the borrowing increases, there is a dip and there is a, right, a rise like this. This is an indicator that companies want to borrow more, want to invest more. That is a, one of the indicators. Okay? So, uh, besides this, there is a discussion related to taper tantrum here. Right? What is the idea of a taper tantrum? Right? A Federal Reserve, which is a central banker of USA. If it starts to hike the interest rates, that is one, and right on the other hand, if it starts to reduce the amount of securities that actually buys back from the market, the amount of money supply in the market will come down, interest rates will rise up. And when the interest rates will rise up, foreign investors rather than investing in Indian economy will withdraw their investments, take these investments to USA, invest there. I can understand the sequence here they will invest in USA. Right? And as a result of this, there is a volatility created in the forex market as well as the, the financial market. Now, what is the situation of India? Is India in a better situation today compared to let us say 2014 when again Federal Reserve had announced a taper tantrum 
and in the last year itself in the month of October November there is already right a taper tantrum which was conducted by the Federal Reserve. So, is India placed better? Definitely yes. How? So, have a look at this. When we talk about taper tantrum back in the year 2014, the total amount of financial outflows or the capital outflows that happened because of this was somewhere around 80,000 crore rupees, was somewhere around 80,000 crores. And during November 2021, when the taper tantrum actually happened, the amount of the capital outflows that happened because of this was somewhere around 35,000 crore rupees. That is one very important point of difference. Second very important point of difference is what is the foreign exchange reserves that you have, right? The foreign exchange reserves that we have today are more than the double the amount of forex reserves that we had back in the year 2014. What is the importance of this? The importance is that whenever there is a tapered tantrum conducted like this, there is a sudden outflow of dollars from India, but in the process of taking out the dollars, there is a volatility created in the forex market. That is a foreign investor will sell a rupee, purchase a dollar and take the dollar out of India. But when they will sell the rupee in the market, the rupee value will start getting depreciated. And that is where the RBI will use the forex reserve to stabilize the exchange rate. So, now have a look at the forex reserve that we have. Very, very high. So, we can control any kind of a tapered tantrum that could happen in the economy. Third very important point that you need to make a note of this is the amount of reserves to total debt. The total debt, external debt, right, that is somewhere around 600 billion dollars. Compare that with the forex reserves that we have. The reserves that we have is more than the debt that we have, which will provide certain confidence to the market investors. So, yes, taper tantrum is happening or might happen again. Because in the month of March, the Federal Reserve has already indicated that it will hike the interest rate. But when that particular interest rate hike will be done, the impact on the Indian economy can be minimized because of these particular indicators. And if UPSC will ask you compare between the situation or let me throw a, a descriptive question, they will simply give a statement like this. India is a better placed today to adjust or to basically address the issues of taper tantrum compared to the earlier situation, elaborate, then you will have to write all of these particular points, done. So, this is one more point of a discussion that has been provided in the economic survey related to the taper tantrum. Next, right, two tables, basically one table which provides information related to sectors which are attracting, right, the FDI equity in, Indi in India and uh, no surprises here, the top or the, the first sector in terms of attracting FDI is a computer, uh, software and the hardware, right. And in terms of countries which are investing huge amount of FDI in India, the top country is Singapore. This could be asked in the UPC prelims, please be very, very careful, right. So, these are the various points of discussion related to uh, the concept of the external trade or the chapter of external trade in the economic survey. So, we will stop the discussion here today. Next week, we will basically pick up from the next chapter that is related to the monetary policy and we will analyze what are the important points which have been provided in the survey related to these particular concepts. Done? So, that is it from my side for the day. If you like this particular initiative, please hit the like button, provide your valuable comments in the section below and if you have not yet subscribed to Baiju's exam prep IS YouTube channel, subscribe now. Thank you. Have a great day.